Thurman, have you been to Montana before? Yes, Big Sky. Okay. Um, I was at a golf tournament up there a couple of years ago for, um, actually it was with Eric Dickinson and the Boys and Girls Club. And um, had a great time up there, really great time. So this is my second time. Did, I, Eric did this event before, so did you talk to him about what, what, what you might expect tonight? No, he said just craziness. <laughs> just craziness and um, support Montana State instead of the other school. <laughs> that was about it. But, uh, you know, no, he just said, you know, it's, it's almost like, um, you know, it's almost like Buffalo. Small town, blue collar people, hard working people that get up every single morning and go to work and um, provide for their families and provide for other people. And, uh, you know, definitely my type of town. That experience playing in Buffalo, what was that like? I mean, uh, a little bit different than a lot of NFL experiences with the big city lights and things like that, but I know right. that the fans are pretty amazing. So what was that you like? You know, it's, it was an amazing ride, 12 years that I played there. Um, actually living back there in Buffalo right now since 2007. Uh, myself, Jim Kelly, who was here, uh, mm -hmm. Steve Tasker, a couple of other players, a couple of players from the 60s. They still, uh, we have one of the top, I think we're in the top three of alumni, uh, former players that live back in the city that they played for. But uh, the fans have been remarkable. Even after 17 years of not making the playoffs, they've still been remarkable. Just a blue collar town that just wants to see their team win. Uh, when you have the Bills and the Sabres, the hockey team, and it's owned by one family, uh, they come out and support it. And uh, the owners, uh, Kim and Terry Pagula, they, they support uh, the community in Buffalo, and uh, it's a great relationship. And uh, it's one of the, I've always said that they're the, they're the best fans in the world, and they deserve a championship. And uh, hopefully, in our, it's, People my age always say in our lifetime, we hope they get one, and hopefully that'll be so. What, do, what drew you back to living in Buffalo, or why do you think that is that so many people that played for the Bills have, have gone back there and still live there? I, it's definitely the people. Um, you know, I, I, I have a lot of friends there, probably more friends in Buffalo than I have in my hometown state of Houston, uh, Houston, Texas. Um, I have a lot of family back in Houston, Texas, but when you talk about the friendship, I have a lot of friends in the Buffalo area that, uh, you know, they, they, they'll just do anything for anybody at any given moment. I mean, you can have a, a family that has some type of tragedy, say, for instance, like uh, a week ago, a um, uh, family, their house burned down, like on a Thursday. And Saturday, somebody put together a function for them, you know, raised you know, almost $150,000 for that family. So those are the type of people that you're dealing with, people that are genuine, people that are true, people that care about, you know, not just the sports aspect of it, but they care about other people's lives. So, I mean, it's uh, uh, all the years that I played, moving back to Buffalo was probably the best move I ever made. Hey, man, I want to ask you about uh, college days and, of course, you know, the Sooners were dominant in those days, but Oklahoma State, you know, also was kind of known as running back school with right. Alfred, Alfred Anderson and yourself. And oh, yeah. For Barry Sanders. And uh, uh, do you feel good about your college career and kind of putting the Cowboys on the, the map there? Oh, I feel great about it. I mean, I mean, it was just I've got here. That's all I've heard about is the rivalry here. Well, it was just a, as bad as it was with Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. I mean, when I was talking uh, out there to some folks, and it was like, you know, back then, I mean, Oklahoma and Nebraska, they were, you know, we were in the Big Eight then, and they were pretty much the dominant team, Oklahoma and Nebraska. And every my four years that I was there, you know, it wasn't so much about, you know, you went on the field to try to win the game, but we were trying to hurt almost every single player that they had for four years in a row. And I think it was in 1985, we took out, I mean, we took out about 10 or 12 stars. I mean, it, it was a it was a bloodbath, and uh, so yeah. I mean, the rivalry that I had with Oklahoma, uh, still to this day, the only person that I ever liked at Oklahoma was Barry Switzer. <laughs> uh, and, and I've always told Mike Gundy this, who's the head coach now at Oklahoma State. I'm, 
every time this game comes up, you're just too nice. You, you talk about what they've done over the past and what they've done this over the year that they've been their plan or whatever. And I've always told them, I said, you know, that's not the way that you should go about it. You should be like, I hate that school. I don't like them. I want to kick their butt in every single sport, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, wrestling, tennis, softball, or whatever. Um, but he's just not like that. And so you kind of, we kind of go back to the former players and we kind of get it going. But uh, it's a rivalry that, uh, you know, it's very intense. And um, they've had the upper hand for, not only, they've had the upper hand for since the program, football program started. I mean, they've won with five, six, seven national championships. So obviously, you know, they've always had a, a great program with Bear Switzer and going back to Bud Wilkerson and those guys. So, um, but uh, we just keep plugging away. You know, I'm always, I'm always, in the, and I'll continue to stay at, uh, Oklahoma State, Montana State, Michigan State, all the state schools, I'm all, I'm all there with them. <laughs> Good joke. <laughs> Having Mike running that program now, what, what's that been like to watch for you? What do you think of the job he's done there at Oklahoma State? I think he's done a great job. You know, obviously, um, with the uh, with the funds that we got from our, our uh, Big alumni, T. Bo Pickens, obviously that has definitely helped the program uh, a lot more to get to where it's at tonight, uh, today. Uh, he's done a fantastic job. Uh, he, and the one thing that I like about Mike is that he's made some tough decisions since he's been a head coach. You know, he's not going to let a guy, that, for instance, uh, Tariq Hill was let go from the team because of domestic violence. You know, he's not going to tolerate those type of behaviors, no type of guys on this, in, this, in the program. <coughs> I think that speaks that speaks volumes of him being a man and really taking control of the program. And I, I think uh, he's done a fantastic job. Uh, you know, I mean, he's the winningest coach now in Oklahoma State hit, history, uh, passing my former coach Pat Jones, um, who he's who Mike was actually a quarterback with for three years. So um, he's done a fantastic job. Uh, we support him. We support the program, and uh, uh, you know they've. They've been close a couple of times, and uh, hopefully, you know, uh, they can get over the hump and uh, you know, try to win a national championship, which I think every school, you know, thrives for all the time. Did you see some of those coaching characteristics in him uh, when, during your playing days? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, you know, he was all – I mean, just – you know, even when he stepped in as a freshman, you know, he was taking command of the whole thing. You know, and well, probably for about ten other guys, and not me. But uh, <laughs> but uh, but you can definitely see it. Uh, one one of those guys who would um, stay after practice, um, work with a receiver back then. My best friend Hartley Dykes. He would work with him after practice. He would go over film, and so you kind of always kind of look like you know. And he was the type of guy who would. I'm not going to the NFL. You know, I, I'm studying film, I'm studying this or whatever, because I, I want to be a coach. And you knew right then and there, uh, from him getting the job later on in his freshman year, that he was going to be a good coach, and it uh, turned out very well for him. Barry Sanders, did you see the, the special nature of what he might bring to the table when you were uh, playing in front of him? Not right off the bat. Huh. Not right off the bat. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I don't think anybody saw it. I mean, you know, you saw spurts of it here and there. I mean, what was it? Um, my junior year, his freshman year, um, I mean, opening kickoff. He ran it back for 100 yards for a touchdown. You know, like, that's okay. But you never did see the moves, like, in practice or anything. Um, and then my senior year, for a consecutive year, you know, he ran it back 100 yards in. But... Uh, and, but my senior year, we kind of knew. I kind of knew that something was up with him, and so you know, even when games where we were like blowing people out or whatever, and uh, I've always been this type of player, you know, hey, look, let's give this guy a shot. Let's, just let it play, you know. Well, we're, we're just going into the fourth quarter. I'm like, well, coach is forty something to nothing, and <laughs> I got 150, 200 yards. I don't need to be in there, right? So why not let him play? And so as the season got along, he got more playing time, more playing time, and um, I would take myself out and knowing that, you know, 
he was going in. I was totally comfortable with him getting carries early in the game, late in the game, or what have you. And uh, um, and so as the season went on, you know, like wow, you know, I'm, it's my senior year, I'm 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 out, and I get drafted by Buffalo, and you know, first game he played, I think he rushed for like 320 yards, something like that. And my coach, who was uh, who played for the Green Bay Packers, Elijah Pitts, uh, back in this Lombardi, <laughs> it was like the first game. We go to the hotel, we have our meetings, and my coach Elijah Pitts looks at me straight in the face and goes, "Well, I hope we didn't draft the wrong guy." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, "Wow, man, I'm just really taking it, man." So, but uh, I mean. Unbelievable. Uh, I mean, I, I, I can actually sit up here and say he's the best running back that I've ever saw, especially with the elusiveness and things of that nature. Um, you know, I, I still always put Jim Brown at top, but when you talk about most exciting and unbelievable cuts and the things that he did in the 10-year period, without question, I would probably say he was probably the most exciting NFL player ever to put over the uniform. There aren't that many anymore, and the ones that there are don't seem like they play 10 or 12 years well. Why do you think that is, or how, why is that the nature of running game in professional football gone the way it's gone? Well, I, I think because you had a number of quarterbacks that came into the league that that's what the, the league wanted to do. They wanted to have the Peyton Mannings, the Phillip Brady's, uh, Phillip Rivers, Tom Brady's. Uh, you know, you're going on and on and on, you know, and Drew Brees and all those guys. But I think you're seeing a resurgence of the running backs come back now because once those guys retire, who is there left? There's not going to be a lot of quarterback, quarterbacks that are top quality. Even when you go back to the Jim Kelly's, Dan Marino days, Jim Elway, you know, you got these guys now, you know, Peyton Manning retired. He, Tom Brady said he want to play six or seven more years. I don't even know what that's about, but you're going to have Rivers and Breeze and all these guys retired, and they're just not, I, I just think in my opinion with the way that the college is set up, there's just not enough guys that are coming out that can, you know, play from under center, that can read a defense, you know, basically the college game is, okay, throw it to the open guy, and they're not, read, they're not reading coverage, and so I don't think you have the numbers that you've seen over the past 15, 20 years, Drew Breeze throwing for over 5,000 yards, I mean, you see some young guys with that right now. Like I, I, I look at Derek Carr as one of those guys. I, I mean, he's absolutely. I feel so bad for the Raiders when they lost him last year. I thought they were, might be the team that could beat New England. So uh, there's not a lot of teams that have that type of quarterback. They're searching. They're searching for. It, but I see now. But you see now, the running backs are coming back. And uh, you know, I've always said, you know, people are like, well, they're going. You no, know, they're not going away. They're not going away. You know? Naturally, they're coming back, and uh, we have a pretty good one in Buffalo with Sean McCoy. I'd love to see him run, I'd love to see him play. So, uh, and you got some guys coming out this year. So, I mean, Barnett from LSU. I don't know how high, how high Christian McCaffrey's going to go, but I'm sure he's going to be an exciting football player uh, coming in. So, uh, I'm excited for the run backs coming up. You know, in the next couple of years. A couple of years ago, Jim Kelly talked about just uh, your guys' run and, and what sort of influence that had on his life, both the successes and the failures. What sort of influence do you think it's had on your life? You know what? It really hasn't really changed my life. Um, you know, obviously not winning the Super Bowl, you know, that's what everybody <coughs> always talks about or whatever. But I think, you know, with, with the team that we had and the players that we had, then how we stuck together over the years, how we rallied around Jim on his cancer bout twice. Um, it really shows the character of the teammates that we had on the four, two, on the four Super Bowl runs and really the entire, you know, you could probably throw 10 to 12 years in there uh, of how close we are, how, how tight-knit of a family we really are. And, uh, and I think that goes to show you, uh, you, know, you know, football is just, it's, football isn't everything. You know, that you, I can sit up here and name tons of football, basketball, baseball, hockey players, great players that never won a championship. 
It just so happened that we went to four in a row. <laughs> and that's what everybody remembers. But uh, it's one of those deals where, you know what, we know that it happened and we'll be remembered for here and forever until the Bills win one. But uh, getting out of that, having a family that we are right now, um, means more than just, means more than winning the Super Bowl right now at this point in time because of the situations that really Jim has been through and not just with him, but I mean, it goes back to his son too. Uh, then it goes back to, you know, Mr. Wilson, our owner passing away. I mean, this is, this is a very tight knit family and, um, and we make it uh, our point to let everybody know that um, well, if you're going to talk about Buffalo Bills, you're going to have about 10 or 12 guys around you that better speak nice of them because, because I mean, we just don't take it. You know, we're, we're, we're outspoken guys that, you know, that endured four years of tough times together and still, at this point, uh, we believe in each other, we love each other, and, um, and uh, so, uh, you know, that's how that family is. And it, it, it will always be like that for me. It was a great picture posted on Twitter with you and Daryl and Andre and those guys. Are you going to mention that to the players tonight? Like, you, this game, you can create a uh, family for life? Something yeah, like yeah. I mean, that was uh, something that I had, you know, in my speech tonight about family, unity, uh, being together. I mean, we, uh, Coach McDermott, who was the head coach of the Bills now, I mean, he was sitting at the table and it was just like, wow, this is, this is incredible. I mean, we're just throwing jabs and talking and just for three hours, you know, just having a good old time like we're 25 year olds. And uh, but but you know what? We we've always been like that. This is nothing new to us. It's just something that he wanted to see for himself and get some ideas of how maybe he can put this type of. family into the, the team that he has now to find some leaders, know what it takes, what type of guys are you looking for. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, no, that was great. It, it's, it's, it's always great when we get together. I mean, we got <coughs> there and now I think we got a trip. First, first week of September, we're going back out to Napa, all of us, taking the wives out there. So it was a great opportunity for us to get together with the head coach, but also plan another trip for us. Yes. And so uh, it's, um, I, I, I think, you know, you, I can sit up here and talk about it, but until you're around it and you see it and see how we interact with each other, you, you will be like, and I guarantee you, if you saw it, you would be like, man, I feel bad for those guys that they didn't win a Super Bowl because they are great guys. And every last one of them that was at the dinner of the night and, yeah, we couldn't have everybody, but even the guys that weren't there, some of the guys that are quote, quote unquote, not the superstars, the guys like Mark Pike, Carwell Gardner, James Lofton, Don Beebe, Kent Hall, I mean, the list goes on and on. The guys that weren't the superstars, but had a major role in the success that we had. What other things we try to get across? What other points we try to get across tonight in your speech? You know, I, 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 I got to get a feel for the crowd right. first. Right. You know, I'm just, you know, I know I can rile them up with a little Montana, Montana State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State going, but, uh, you know, I, I haven't really thought about it. I mean, I have thought about it. I just got to look at my notes a little bit more and just to see, look, you, you, you're talking to a bunch of, what, 18 to 22, 23-year-old kids. I mean, just hopefully most of them not on their phone. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I just I just always wanted to create just a positive message about everything. You're gonna go through your highs and lows throughout life, um, but uh, always have a plan, a backup plan. Anything else for Thurman?